Dr. Dave has worked in the field of applied anthropology for over 35 years as a conference speaker and published author. His past laboratory research included the design of hundreds of automated information systems, video manuals, man-machine interfaces, and intelligent machines. Dr. Dave also headed up problem-solving teams for incident reconstruction to determine causes and possible solutions. In the field, Dr. Dave worked as a scientist throughout Panama and Central America for th three years, a week at a time, um, sometimes even as long as a month at a time. During his time in the Darien, Panama's jungle, valuable lessons were learned that he is willing to share. You can get lost 20 feet into the jungle. And while in Central America, Dr. Dave researched many of the backstories of the local history and people, and now shares his findings with audiences on land and sea for the past nine years. Well, we're so pleased to have you, Dr. Dave. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn over the microphone to you uh, to share ab about this wonderful uh, museum. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Roberts. I'll be your presenter today. Uh, I'm a docent here, also on the board of directors. So if we have any complaints or wishes or things you want to improve, just send them our way. We're always glad to do something uh, for the general public. Uh, today, we're going to be taking you through four different wings of the museum. Uh, we're not a big museum, but we have a lot of really interesting things, things that you won't find anywhere else in the entire world. And, uh, and so we'll just get with it. Uh, so we have, we're going to start in the anthropology wing. And then we'll go to archaeology, natural history, and our art wing. So we'll do four wings all together. Kind of panorama, you can see that a little bit. And uh, up on the wall is our founder, Dr. Lewis. And what you're looking, what you'll be seeing today is the work primarily of one man's dream actually coming true uh, with his friends and a lot of associates, of course. So the first thing I want to show you, come on over here is uh, a headdress. And you may think, oh, this is just like any other headdress, but it's not. It's the only one like this in the entire world. And the reason why it's so special, this was given to us by the Lindbergh family. This was a headdress that was given to Charles Lindbergh in 1927, when he successfully flew across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, everyone said, you're gonna die, but he obviously didn't, he made it. The Sioux Nation thought he was such a brave individual, he deserved to be a chief, an honorary chief. And this is the headdress that was presented to him. And it's unlike any other headdress because most headdresses, let me spin around and show you, uh, have the tail feathers from eagles. And that's, that's that marks you as a chief. Uh, nice wide, uh, broad feathers from, and, uh, from a bald eagle. But these, from the tips of the wings, their flight feathers, because he was a pilot. I think that's really cool. And this is the only headdress like it in the entire world, and it's here at the Heritage of the Americas Museum. Let me show you some more things as we go through. I mentioned we have some beautiful beadwork and other things. And what I try to stress to all our visitors is that this only happened after European contact. Before European contact, uh, you're making uh, beads out of porcupine quills, pieces of shell, little pieces of wood, whatever. And uh, it's not very beautiful, but it's functional. It acts as necklaces and so on. But after the Europeans arrived with glass beads, those were some heavy duty trade items. And Native Americans love that stuff. And well, over here we have some, this is from the Hearst estate. So we have some very nice things. Uh, and you see the beadwork is incredible, but the actual beads themselves are from European descent. And when the, the Europeans, then Americans actually uh, uh, arrived, uh, they would ask, who's the chief? When I make first contact? And they would usually point to an individual who had a couple of feathers in his hair. That was it, that marked him as a chief. But after the Europeans arrived, Native Americans started, started building all kinds of beautiful regalia, wonderful headdresses and so on. And we see this is all post-contact. And I like to think that this was the coming together of two worlds. You have this creative nature 
and Native Americans. And then you have some of these products that were not available prior to the Europeans arriving. So not all the contact situations were hostile. Some were very favorable to both sides. And I kind of like that idea. Let's move on a little bit. Again, some beadwork that you can see here. And none of this existed before the Europeans. Uh, all of a sudden, things started, started getting dressed up, as it were. Uh, instead of just having a war hammer, you had a war hammer, mostly for uh, ceremonial use with beautiful beadwork. And uh, like, I, like I said, it, it was a coming together of different societies. And there were always compromises to be made. For instance, uh, among the Navajo, uh, their gods are very special and they believe in a, what we call animism where spirits can actually inhabit uh, different products, trees, limbs, and even rugs. And one of the trading post items that people were asking for visitors and the trading post was the, the, the go-between between the Native Americans and visitors. It didn't just go out to the reservation in those days. Uh, they wanted the gods, the Navajo gods, on a rug. And the visitors were asking for this. And of course, the Native Americans and Navajo said, no, we can't do that. Because if we trapped the gods on a rug, that would be a very bad thing. So they came up with a compromise. And the compromise was on the backside of this rug is what we call a ghost thread. So the gods could get off the rug from the inside and get off to the outside. Compromise, and, and both sides were happy with that. I'll point, show you some more things. Like I said, we have many one-of-a-kind items here, and this is a one-of-a-kind item, and you would have just walked by it if I hadn't shown it. Uh, this was a Native American princess visiting Theodore Roosevelt in 1906 while he was a sitting president and having lunch with him. And she wore this dress, not a copy, this dress. And if there were gold coins around the neck, it wouldn't be worth any more. These are dentillium beads. And each one you can think of as a small piece of gold. So obviously it's worth a fortune to Native Americans. So they dressed her up really well. And she had lunch with the president, Theodore Roosevelt, in the White House. Pretty cool, this dress. And we have a lot of other things that you can see. And you could just spend literally uh, hours uh, just going through each case, case by case, and everything from the Pacific Northwest, the Haida, Dingit, and other folks uh, in the Pacific Northwest, all the way to more uh, Plains Indians, and we have a little bit of everything. So let me show you some more great things. And the kids always ask me, why all the little heads? And this is Teotihuacan, a valley of Mexico, and what Farmers would generally do is to help their crops and make sure they were successful, would plant a little head in the field, sort of their, their family god, as it were. And every year they would usually add a new one. So it was very easy to find all these little heads. And these date to about 200 to about 500 uh, common era to about 200 uh, before the common era or before Christian era, whatever you like to use. And so these little heads are kind of an interesting thing. And that's the whole point of going through here a little bit slowly and just taking your time. And you'll find all kinds of really interesting things from arrow sharpeners to, uh, to little uh, home deities, just all kinds of interesting things. And at the end of each of the, our, our wings, we generally have uh, murals. And we like to kind of illustrate how people were actually interacting uh, back in the day, and early contact, especially this is, these are Cheyenne, the Plains Indians, and they have horses, and the Spanish brought horses back to the Americas. Uh, there were horses at one time in the Americas, but Paleo Indians, uh, well, we ate them all. That's just what we did. So the Spanish brought horses, these are Cortez and some of the others, and they became uh, a mode of transportation for the Plains Indians, raised the whole level of their culture, uh, to, to something that uh, was rather high level of civilization. They were mobile. What they would do is they would trade for items that they wanted. Uh, and a fair trade was you would stack up pelts up until the height of a muzzle of a rifle. And it was a fair trade. And you can see the Americans and the Europeans, French and, and some others coming down and trading for the pelts. And these were items that both sides wanted. 
uh, the traders wanted the pelts and the Native Americans wanted the, the rifles. But uh, free enterprise being what it is, uh, the Europeans started making barrels on the rifles really long so they'd get more pelts. Let me show you. There's absolutely no reason at all to make a rifle with a, with a barrel this long. The velocity isn't increased at all, it has no weight, but you will get more pelts for it. What can I say? Free enterprise at work. And that's the gun that won the West, the Colt Peacemaker. Uh, was a God made man. Uh, Sam Colt made them all equal with that. And this is the rifle that won the West. It was a model, uh, Winchester model 1873. Uh, loaded on Sunday and shoot it all week. So we have different uh, illustrations of, of period pieces and so on. And of course, the famous Sharps rifle, Sharps shooter, so named for the rifle. This is a carbine version, a little bit shorter, but you can see the size of the bullets are rather massive. And they would use these to hunt buffalo or some other large animals. Let's, come, let's move on a little bit. And one of the things that the Native Americans would trade for was things made out of metal, especially uh, iron, steel, copper, bronze, because they didn't smelt uh, any of these metals in the New World. But they could make handles. They were pretty good at that. So this is an illustration of trade items, which are primarily the metal parts, and the Native Americans would make the other parts, the handles. And my favorite is this over here. It's the trade item is obviously the blade, but the handle is made from a bear jaw. Pretty creative, if you ask me. And what is the hardest bone in your body? Of course, your jawbone, because that's the one we use the most. Pretty clever. And prior to, uh, I just mentioned it, this was an ax prior to contact. It's a piece of lump, lump of rock, as it were, carved out. And I think it was kind of hard to uh, uh, work, work with wood or anything else. It, obviously, metal was a big, big uh, upgrade, so to speak. And I can say we have lots and lots of things. If you just kind of spend some time uh, here, uh, everyone's always welcome. And I tell the kids, uh, here's some early versions of Barbie down here. Uh, at least I think that's where the Americans got the idea. And a uh, trapdoor spider nest, which are made into necklaces. And that's one of the things that I appreciate about Native Americans. They use material at hand, whatever was handy, was available, they came up with very creative ways uh, to produce some beautiful products, whether it be baskets that are woven uh, pine needles or, or grass to pottery uh, made from local sources. I will show you some more things. And we say heritage of the Americas, we do mean the entire America, South and North America. And this is the high Arctic here being represented. And of course, the canteen which is the uh, bladder uh, or stomach of a seal. We probably wouldn't have done that, but if you need a canteen and this is a handy object, that's how it works. And uh, Native Americans or Eskimo sunglasses is always my, one of my favorite items. Uh, they actually work and, uh, and, and uh, of course they can't go to a store and buy something like Ray-Bans and so on. So they manufacture their own. A ladle made out of the horn of a goat, they heat it and shape it. And I wouldn't have thought of something like that, but they're very clever and like I say, using materials at hand. And this is the high Arctic, the Haida, actually um, in the Was in, in Washington state and uh, British Columbia. And of course, very clever uh, woodworking. Uh, it could actually make boxes uh, the Haida and Klingit and some of the folks of the Pacific Northwest out of cedar that were watertight. That good at woodworking. Let's go over to another wing. I think uh, we probably spent a few minutes here. We'll go over to the archaeology. On your way out, look at the saw Come on over. And uh, this is uh, uh, pretty much uh, pre-contact this particular wing. And we'll go through some of the things that 
that happened in the Americas before the, the Europeans arrived. And I always like to go over here and show the kids, I think it's there's, uh, when we say Paleolithic or Stone Age, most of the, most of the items uh, you see here were created without metal. It was Stone Age people use flint, chert, which is kind of a crystallized form of, of flint, or obsidian was, were the main three uh, uh, materials to actually making arrowheads, but not just arrowheads, spear points, uh, digging tools, and the different types of things uh, for scrapers and so on. Everything that we would have made out of metal, they were making out of stone. There was actually no need to actually smelt metal. Uh, the, the, in fact, uh, obsidian makes a blade that is so sharp, it's uh, often used in modern surgeries. Interesting. So maybe they knew something we didn't know. And this is an interesting, uh, this is what artists think. Uh, this fellow is attacking a uh, uh, Colombian mammoth with a spear. And this was not how they hunted. <laughs> he would be the soft, squishy stuff between the mammoth's uh, toes very quickly. Instead, they used uh, what was called an addle addle. This is a, a very large dart with fletching uh, feathers and very long tips. And this would have propelled by a stick, which was actually an extension of your arm, the little hook on the end. And you would actually flick the, the spear or dart at the animal. And you could actually put one of those uh, darts through a car door. A lot of power, a lot of hitting power. It was used against Spanish armor very successfully. And of course, bringing down large animals, paleolithic animals, megafauna. And one of the things I like about this museum is we just we, we try to emphasize the artistic aspect to uh, displays. So this isn't just one thing after another lined up in a row. We try to add some artistic component to some of the displays. You can see we also have other visitors in the museum. So you're not alone, don't worry. And we have lots of things uh, representing different uh, Hokum and Anasazi, Anasazi were the ancient people uh, living in the Four Corners area of the United States. Uh, and you can see some influences uh, all the way down into Mexico. And I, I kind of like that, that uh, you can see that these people were trading, they were talking to each other, uh, actually uh, trading for things they wanted. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, things like a rabbit blankets uh, from the Anasazi uh, and in going north, perhaps some type of pottery or feathers or other types of things. We we're trading things that the other side didn't have. Let's move on a little bit. Like I say, this is, this is a beautiful display here. And you can see that much of this was donated by friends of Bud Lewis, the fellow who actually built this museum. This is Randy West, uh, his owner. You see some of these beautiful displays. I like this, and it kind of reflects the painting itself, and a very nice artistic uh, component. And that's one of the things we try to stress here, that, that art and science, and it's all one mixed thing. You can't have a building that's strong and built well if it doesn't look good as well. So there has to be an artistic component in most of the things we do. And let me show you one of my favorite sets of arrowheads. And you would have missed it if I hadn't shown you. Up here are one, two, three, red, and then a, kind of a bluish green. I'm a little bit colorblind. And uh, that's not one of the three materials that I talked about earlier, uh, chert, flint, or obsidian. That's something different. Those are made from telegraph pole uh, insulators. Uh, the, 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 the Europeans and the Americans were, were essentially bringing wires across Native American land. And on top of these poles were separators, insulators made of glass, and they made perfectly good material for making arrowheads. I um, won't say anything more about that, but it's, you know, you use the material that you have at hand. Okay, this is uh, Hopewell. And a lot of folks think that Native Americans, at least, uh, in the uh, other than Mesoamerica, were living in teepees and tents and so on. But actually, they were living in walled cities. DeSoto in 1830 came through the Mississippi Valley, Valley uh, and saw 
cultures that were living in cities, uh, raised mounds and walled uh, defenses and so on. These were very sophisticated cities uh, that, that were in the Americas and not necessarily in Mesoamerica, but actually in Northern America, Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. And you can see some of the objects they produced, uh, we call it ephemera sometimes. My wife calls it junk, uh, or clay pipes and so on and carved pipes and demonstrates that they had plenty of time to produce these types of objects. They had specialized craftsmen, pretty interesting. And the mural at the end of this gallery show the Native Americans in this area, primarily uh, the Kumeyaay, uh, La Jolla Indians and some others. And obviously they didn't have air conditioning. So they had other ways to deal with the heat during the summer. Pretty interesting. And now we're getting into, uh, I, I like to call them uh, my friends, Maya. Not Mayan, Maya is, uh, is both uh, singular and plural. So Sotros los Maya, and they, they say we are Maya, singular, and also means plural. But if you see decorations on the inside of these polychrome pots, they were generally buried, burial uh, goods. But if you see uh, actually nothing on the inside, just on the outside, it could have been utilitarian wear sometimes used in homes, but most often for ceremonies. Let me show you one. This is a, a pot that, was, uh, that has birds and glyphs and other types of uh, symbols on the outside. Some, some are, are, there's many different ways that Maya had of writing, uh, pictorial as well as glyphs, and they also had another form, which is very complex. But there's nothing on the inside. So this could have been used uh, to collect blood, which was one of the things that the nobles would, would provide. This was the ruling classes. One of your jobs was to provide blood. You would pierce your tongue, collect the blood, and then dip pieces of paper into the blood and pass them out to the participants at the ceremony. They could take it home, put it in the fire, watch the smoke rising, and do divination. And this was part of the, the whole process of the, the shedding of blood, which was a Christian theme as well, and there are many Christian ideas that were also incorporated in uh, previous uh, to contact into the Maya world, uh, such as uh, the cross. They had the cross sacred and incense and many different things. So when the missionaries came with Christianity, it was just another layer, as it were. If you go to uh, anywhere in Central America where it's, uh, the Maya are living, you'll see a, a duality of religions. You'll see the old ways with the sacred mounds and so on, and you also see uh, Christianity full blown. So it's just a combination that they, and an accommodation they made. And of course the Omic, the predecessors of the Maya, and you see the pouty face, the turned on mouth, uh, puffy eyes, and it looks African. And many people, oh, they came from Africa. No, uh, the, the actual uh, genetics would indicate that they've always lived there. And I have pictures of people that look exactly like some of the portrayals that you see here. Let's see. Oh, this is over here, uh, textiles. These are Peruvian textiles. And uh, you see the feathers and some of the textiles, they look like they're new. They're actually over a thousand years old. These come from one of the driest places on earth, the Atacama Desert. I've been there many times and I know people my age, that old, uh, that have never seen it rain. It's one of the driest places on earth. So when you put things in the ground, they stay pretty much the same. And wait, I've been kind of glossing over things. These are pots with holes in them. Uh, the holes were intentionally made. Same concept as a ghost thread uh, for Navajo. But in this case, they're letting the spirits out of the pots prior to burial. And you wouldn't want to bury a pot with a spirit in it. Mean, animism is a particular idea. Okay, let's look at the next wing over. I think we're pretty much on schedule. And this wing, I, I usually have a little bit of fun. I let the kids touch the hadrosaur eggs. These are ductile dinosaurs, 65 million years old. And then 
without realizing it. I said, oh, touch the cupolite also. And this is down here, a little white stone. It's actually petrified uh, dinosaur excrement. <laughs> but they don't know that when they're touching it. Then I tell them afterwards, and, oh, everybody has to get it. Well, that's just some of the fun things we do here. And I tell them, uh, oh, also our visitors, uh, these are the oldest things in the museum. And it's not me. Uh, we have visitors from outer space or when our, our solar system was being created. Uh, there was a lot of leftover material between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And once in a while, Jupiter gives a little gravitational nudge, things come flying into the inner solar system. We call them meteorites or asteroids if they're big enough. And there was two primary types. Actually, there's, there's a few more, but we'll just talk about the two. Uh, iron and then stony are two different types. And you can see that when they come through the atmosphere, they blade on the front surface, actually they have a crust as it were. And then they hit, and these have obviously been weathering for a while. The ones that you see nice and shiny and so on, those probably haven't weathered very much, but they rust very quickly uh, because they're iron, of course. And then we have tectites, very unusual. Tectites are technically not meteorites. They've been blown off the surface of the Earth by an impact, go up into space and come back down again. These were blown off the surface of the Earth in Cambodia, came down in Vietnam. They're oblong in shape. They get elongated as they go through the atmosphere. Interesting. And again, tectite. It's interesting. Uh, funny word, I like to say. And then we have lots of minerals here and specimens. Uh, and one of the things that we like is we partner with other organizations in the area. The El Cajon Gem and Mineral Society is one. They've been very good. I think they'll be meeting here tonight. They use our facilities, uh, but they often provide us with all kinds of wonderful specimens. And, and I'll show you one of, one of my favorites. This is an amethyst, and it would make a beautiful pennant. Uh, you could wear it around your neck, uh, put a little gold chain and so on. You'd be the only one at the party with a 400 pound piece of amethyst on your neck. But Maybe not. And then we have all, all kinds of beautiful crystals. And I'm always amazed that nature can make such things, usually in, in places that you don't want to be. Uh, most of these are deep, dark caves, uh, very hot. People have to wear special suits, cooling suits, as well as breathing apparatus to enter some of these locations. But you can see some of these made in the heart of the earth. Just wonderful things. I mean, what a beautiful pyrite crystal. Just amazing. And I said that Native Americans uh, didn't use copper or iron. That's a little bit of a misnomer. Sometimes they would find natural uh, pockets of copper and the moche and several people uh, groups in South America use uh, these natural formations to make uh, the heads of uh, uh, lances and other types of uh, war, war material, and it would find natural copper. This was Michigan, and this is from Michigan also, but the same type of material is available in Peru, Ecuador, and South America. So let's move on a little bit. And, and of course, we, we, have, we have to add a little bit of a story to some of our uh, exhibits. And this is Billy, the bee down here. And uh, he was just minding his own business. Could have been a female. Uh, I think Billy goes both ways and, uh, in, in terms of name recognition. Uh, Billy was just flying around about 50 million years ago, got stuck on the side of a tree, got engaged in and he is today for us to see. And one of the things I like about this museum is our ammonite. Dr. Dave, it sounds like you're breaking up.
Looks like we lost them. I'm going to try and get them back. Okay, we're good to go again. I think we have a little technical difficulty. I blame the internet. We always blame the internet too. Uh, I just wanted to mention, this is one of the best collections of trilobites and ammonites in the entire world. Uh, there are none better, let's put it that way. And this is the way we usually find them. We open up a rock and what's inside. Ta-da. And, and the kids like that. But these are obviously prepared by, by professionals. I apologize for the minor interruption, but we, 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 that's, we roll on. This is an example of what you'll find in high Arctic. Uh, these were in permafrost, much newer specimens, 15,000, 25,000 years ago. And things today are coming out of the permafrost. We have uh, some heating of the earth, uh, and uh, we're, we're finding new uh, items all the time. Not just this size. Uh, what's interesting is we're also finding uh, some uh, viruses and bacteria that were frozen for tens of thousands of years, and those can be new visitors too. And in the La Brea tar pit is yet another way animals get preserved. Uh, walk out into a shallow pond and there's tar below it and they get stuck and eventually become part of our specimens here. And we have uh, two different skulls here. One is, this is an over a tar pit that came out of China. And it says a Smilodon, uh, saber cat, uh, not a saber tooth tiger. They're not a tiger, uh, different species. But you can see the long, elongated uh, blade-like teeth and this is a casting of one, it's not real. Uh, and of course, Allosaurus, that's also a casting. We can't afford the real one, but they're anatomically correct the models. And the saber cats uh, are, are folks that came uh, first through the Americas, Paleo Indians encountered these and uh, they killed the last one and they ate the last one. That's what we did with that thing I talked about, Adel Adel. You see over on the side, all kinds of beautiful items. Uh, and some of these have perhaps marginal museum uh, value, but we like them, they're pretty, they're nice to look at. And there's a lot of things here are things that you make out of the raw materials on the other side of this gallery. And uh, and of course, the tarantulas, very tasty. And over here is one of my favorite items. This is a pine cone. And you can see the seeds inside. Uh, it was actually mineralized, it, obviously in stages. I don't know how this happens. Perhaps a geologist would be able to figure that out for us. But all kinds of interesting fossils uh, and specimens, uh, shark teeth. Not the little sharks that we encountered, the great whites and everything. These, these were sharks as big as a bus. Just interesting, all kinds of little bits and pieces and skulls and different things to look at. And what, one of the things I, I, I like is uh, we do have a taxidermetry uh, in most of the galleries. And these were donated by a hunter, took a, taken with a bow and arrow, ethically, which supports the local game reserves, which he came out of. And, once food was donated to local people, and uh, there was nothing wasted, as it were. And game management is something which is uh, scientifically correct, and it is ethical at the same time. Uh, if, if some animals are not managed, it's too predators and so on. So this isn't just random hunting money. Let's so go look at uh, our last area. And we also, this is, the, here's uh, one of our exhibits set up. This is uh, a rock feast. Normally it's, it's in the summertime, it's out at the, uh, the Delmar Fair, 
This is his uh, home for the rest of the year. El Cajon Gemma Hermosa Society. Very nice. Uh, big contributors, big helpers of this museum. Don't need any of this though, for your time. Okay. I have to wave my arms, wake up the uh, and uh, this is kind of nice. And this is the fellow who built the museum. Uh, he ran a sheet metal business over in El Cajon, uh, Santee, that area, and he took his personal fortune with his wife, of course, and uh, got together with Dr. Sicada uh, here at the, at the uh, Grossmont uh, Junior College, and he built this building, donated it to the school, and and fill it up with all these wonderful things. And if anybody tells you you can't do anything, one man built this museum. And I think it's pretty cool. And his friends, of course. And what we try to teach uh, the kids uh, or visitors when they come here is different types of arts, different styles. And this is an example of realism. And this is a uh, Alfredo uh, 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 painting. We have four of his, and he follows his family through their their history as a small child, and eventually she gets married, she has children. And it's a nice series, we like it a lot. And this is a Granados, an example of modern art. And, and I tell the kids, whatever you think is happening, that's probably what's happening. Uh, modern art gets into your head as it were, and different, different expressions, different ideas, different concepts. And the artist kind of starts you off and then you go your way. And one of the things we're really pleased with uh, is we have the collection from a gentleman by the name of Padre Johnson. Uh, that was a name given to him. He was a, he was a both a um, a uh, medic and a chaplain during Vietnam. He saw the darker side of human behavior. Uh, many of his friends were dying in front of him. And he held their hand while they were passing. It was just a terrible experience for him. When he got out, uh, he eventually. Uh, started work as a cowboy. I mean, some homies. and he, it turns out he's a, he's a wonderful artist. He has this talent, and and rather than just just do Western art, he decided to go on a journey. Uh, Twelve years, uh, he traveled all around the world, and there's 22 in this series. He this is the the, the, the founding piece, and it's five different colors, kind of hold everything together. But his idea was to go and just meet people and find out what it was like. And the name of this exhibit is the Global Human Family. We all have the same desires. We have the same wants and needs. And we want you know, good food for our kids. We want safe schools. We want all the things that, that everyone wants. And that binds us together into one global family. And that's the concept behind many of these paintings. And you'll see like this is Indonesia, Philippines. Uh, and it, he knew everyone in every painting, every face. There's about 20 or 30 different faces on each, uh, each painting. And he lived with these people, he found out what they were all about. And it's one common thread that runs all the way through. This is desire to just have a good life. And that's what this portrays. He could have given the, the paintings to anyone. Uh, the New York Museum wanted it, several others, uh, the, the UN wanted them. And they ended up here because he believed in the mission of this particular museum to, to inspire, to show kids and, and adults you know, new things, things they've never experienced before and get them pointed in the right direction. That's what this museum is all about. And this is a local artist, Wedgholz. He's out in El Cajon, he died recently, 10, 15 years ago, but a wonderful local artist. And we have some of his pieces as well. And there's lots of things I'm just glossing over, uh, just showing you the highlights as it were. This is Marjorie Reed. She's a local artist out in the Borrego uh, Desert. And I think that's her house over there. And Bud, the fellow who built this museum, goes out to buy a few of her paintings. She's up on the roof and she says, come back tomorrow, I'm fixing my roof. And he decided to make the trip a second time. And he actually got to be friends with her and bought some of her paintings. And this is an example of Impressionism. It's the Butterfield stage. It ran from St. Louis through San Diego and up to Los Angeles. Nice piece of history. And you can go there if you want, if you have a four-wheel drive. And 
Again, we have lots of textiles and interesting things, uh, pottery from different periods. Some museums have a lot, for instance, a lot of moche pots, one particular period. But here we see moche, Nazca, Chimu, different, different periods and different times. And you can do the comparison for yourself, see how they're different. And uh, for instance, highly decorated, uh, the Nazca pieces, and uh, they're quite early. Same people did the lines in the desert. And again, more textiles uh, from the Atacama Desert. And a fourth type of art that we talk about is three-dimensional. And this is a Frederick Remington, the Frederick Remington. And you can buy this or your house, pick one. Uh, they're very nice uh, pieces. And it's all about putting things in front of kids that get them excited. Beautiful art, uh, examples that, that they would not normally see in, in normal situations. And that's the whole thing to inspire, to get them pointed in the right direction. But this is a nice thing. It's called uh, coming through the rye. And obviously they're fin finishing a trail ride and they're going to town and going to have maybe some buttermilk or some tea or some other beverage of drink. And, and this is one of the nice items I like a lot. Uh, this is, we call it just the Jade ship, Jade dragon ship. And this is the trip uh, ship that will carry over to the other side when you pass. And there's an interesting story behind this actually. Uh, this a lady comes into the museum, says, I would like to donate this jade ship I have uh, when, when I pass. And, uh, and Bud, the fellow who's running the museum, says, uh, let me take a look at it. Goes out to her house, takes a look at it, takes some measurements, comes back to the museum, builds the case, and then calls her up and said, why wait until you die? I have the case built for it already. So Bud Lewick was, was kind, of a, kind of like Father Joe. You never say no to Father Joe. You know how to get people to kind of do the right thing. Pretty good story though. And this is the jade suit, 2000 years old. They believe that if you uh, cover yourself with jade, which is pretty impermeable, uh, you would, your body would last forever. Well, when we found it, it was flat as a pancake and it took about two years to put it back together. This came out of a China, the Three Gorge Dam project. The people were told, Go and dig up what you want because it's going to be underwater in a few years. Uh, keep uh, what, what, what you find. Give us the gold and silver. And this was one of the items that was actually left to the people to sell to compensate them for land. Everybody wins. And this is the Weecho up here. Uh, every little bee is pressed in one at a time. Pretty cool. They're up in the hills above uh, Puerto Vallarta, about two hours drive. And... One of the things that happened very shortly, within about a 20 year period, people started discovering this, these types of things but by people uh, were bringing it down into Puerto Vallarta and all of a sudden it caught on. And now everyone in the village uh, of the Huicho is actually making this, I call it a cottage industry and they have paved roads, they have schools, they have medical facilities and it's all paid for by this, by this home craft as it were. So we benefit, we have beautiful objects, they have jobs and uh, a better living. Good example. And this is, uh, again, what this museum is all about. This is a painting of Bud Ludwig, the fellow who built his place with his personal fortune. And as an eight year old, is he having a good time? I would say yes. Uh, he's just having a wonderful time. He's learning about Native American things science, all kinds of things. And that's the experience he wants kids that come here to have. They've never seen things. They get excited. Wow, look at this. And this is, I've never seen a meteorite right before. And it's just get them pointed in the right direction. Show them options that perhaps they hadn't seen before. And get if you get well, one or two kids out of a group, it, uh, now on the right path, we've done our job. And that's what this museum is all about. So come on, I'll show you something. And you've been so good, I'm gonna show you something. Uh, the scariest thing that you will ever encounter in the jungle, if you encounter them, you will probably not survive. And these are grave robbers, tomb robbers. They are stealing the history and selling it for profit of their country. They're, just, they're, just, they're sawing the fronts off of Sila and, and so on and selling it to unscrupulous dealers. If they get caught, they will go to jail for a long, 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 and about six more long time. Uh, and they don't want to be caught, so they carry automatic weapons and so on. 
and visitors stumble upon them and they're never found again. And so these are not just unscrupulous individuals, they're very dangerous as well. And uh, in fact, the artist who drew this, he drew it from memory and he actually encountered this scene. He almost was a casualty. The guide he was with was the brother of one of the gentlemen on, on this team, as it were, and they let him go. But had it not been for the, the brother, the guide, uh, he would have perished as well. And again, more textile, I have lots of textiles at a Kama Desert again. And what I find cool are the feathers. The feathers look new, and these are well over a thousand years old. So textiles are something which normally don't get preserved, but they do in the Atacama. The beaters are so dry. So if you're into textiles, weavings, and so on, this is the place to come. And lots of interesting things. Uh, we have, uh, this is a site after it's been cleared. Uh, prior to being uh, cleared, you'll encounter something like this over here. Uh, I've been 10 feet away from a temple or, or uh, you know, a stila and not see it because of trees and the vegetation is so thick, vines growing up and, and so on. Sometimes trees growing right out of, on the top of temple mounds. But after a few years, then, then the tourists move in and you can actually see things up close and personal. And this is an example of uh, an individual uh, weaver, Douglas Weaver, who's a very accomplished local artist. I love this piece. I mean, it's just kind of with the smoke rising from the fire and she's cooking something. And he's a local artist, he passed recently, and his family donated all of his art to this museum. And I thought it was really generous. So some of the pieces, like I say, what it was donated. Sells quite well in galleries as well. And we like to tell stories here at the museum. And, uh, are these Iroquois or Algonquin? Hmm. Well, they're probably uh, Algonquin because these are French. And the French work with the Algonquin uh, people. Uh, the Iroquois work with the British. And they were weaponized during the French and Indian War. Uh, so they used them actually as, as foot soldiers. Uh, not such a good thing. But otherwise, if you see uh, the French, were, they were traded locally with the Algonquin people. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, many of the routes into the West were, were, were actually uh, formulated. And you can see mountain men. Uh, we have paintings over here. And these were also people that worked with the Native Americans. It wasn't a hostile situation. Many of them took Native American wives. Uh, they lived as Native Americans. Uh, much of the, the decorations, the bags and so on are, are Native American in origin. And these were the folks that opened up the West uh, with the help of Native Americans, of course. And uh, they go out into the wilderness to determine new routes and roads and uh, you know, what was over the next hill, as it were. And these are some more of the Rodriguez paintings that I talked about earlier. And he's following uh, the young girl into womanhood and with her kids on the back of the horse and her husband, of course. Just a beautiful story being told. And we would love his work. We have four of his original paintings and many of uh, other pieces that he created. And the young girl, and of course, now she's uh, a grandmother herself. And this is uh, Mark Louis, and this is the son of the, the, the fellow who built this entire museum, Bud Louis. He's an accomplished artist as well. Comes here often, and he's more than welcome. And one of the things I like to, uh, to mention is we believe it isn't just a matter of showing you things. If you come here, we like you to actually have something available that you can take away tangible. So we have a little store and prices are very reasonable. Of course, we have the infamous rubber, uh, wooden snakes, you know, terrorize your sister uh, or brother. And we have other pieces which are a little bit pricey that kids don't buy, but adults can buy. Uh, Gina dolls and so on. They have shark teeth and different types of things. And it's to mark your time when you came to the museum, a tangible thing that you can uh, touch and feel. And take home. And uh, if you have any questions or concerns or things that you would like to, we're always looking for docents. 
uh, if you want to volunteer, this is the place. Uh, you want to feel good about doing something good. This is the place to do it. Uh, we have lots of other things. Uh, obviously, I can't go through everything in the museum. But four weeks, you could probably spend a good two or three hours here. Uh, if you're a researcher, maybe even more time. Uh, we have uh, original pieces and uh, different institutions. We're more than happy to work with. Uh, loaning out, or if you want to examine a particular piece, uh, off, take it off exhibit, we can do that. We have lots of connections that we can make very easily, and we're very accommodating. This is a resource for the community. Uh, we have two patios uh, for, for dining or for having a soiree, as it were. So if you have a wedding or some other kind of thing, uh, also, uh, we're more than available. And we have a whole we have a conference room back with local women's clubs use and other clubs in the area. So we're a resource for the community. And if, if you'd like to join with us, we're more than happy to do that. And I think that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you have any questions, can we open it up for questions or concerns or thoughts? Or, yes, remember, Dr. Dave, this was absolutely phenomenal. I had no idea. I don't know how that, this technology uh, your works. Exhibits <laughs> the were, short answer. Were this good. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mystery. The things go through the wire. So I'm an anthropologist by trade. Uh, computers I use, but the details are beyond me. Okay, members, are there any Your questions? Concerns, thoughts? Otherwise, we'll say no, I, I think Well, well thank, thank you, you very so much. much. For coming, and you're always welcome. Uh, kids are always free here, and seniors, a special discount.